My name is Allison Leopold Tilly, and I co-head the Corporate Securities and Technology Practice at Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman. And we work from everything from the two entrepreneurs walking in the door with an idea, forming their company, financings, M&A, IPO, and beyond. So today I'm going to start at the very beginning. And um, I wanted to get an idea from those of you in the audience, kind of what you're interested in. So how many of you uh, have started a company before? Okay. How many of you want to start a company someday? Most of you, okay. <laughs> Why are the rest of you here? No. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, have it be uh, more dynamic while we're talking today, so please stop me if you have any questions as I go, if I say anything confusing, or you want to know anything specific. Uh, just raise your hand and I'll do my best to answer it. So today we're talking about a lofty title of legal issues for entrepreneurs, but it's really the basics of, of what to do when you want to start a company. So what I, I and I'm going to apologize in advance, I'm just getting over this flu that everybody's had, so I'll try not to cough too much, and especially for the tape, I hope I don't have a hacking cough in the tape. But um, we're going to start, this is the outline of what we're going to cover today. So first, oh well, I guess we're going to cover it very quickly. <laughs> okay. If it stays there. Okay. We're going to start with um, leaving your current employer, and then we're going to talk about corporate formation, ultimately structuring the ownership among the various founders, and then uh, lastly, we're going to talk about stock options and granting those. So first of all, most people who start a company are already working somewhere else. It can scroll me. It's scrolling me every time, I think. Um, so. So some people start, they come out of maybe straight out of business school, so you're not currently working somewhere else. But most of the people who start a company have a current job, and so uh, that's really where I'm going to start from, what you want to do. So you've decided to leave your current employer, and you're going to start a new company. So the first thing you should do is obtain a copy of your employment agreement or any other documentation that you have signed when you went to work for the company. And usually you'll have maybe an offer letter, maybe an employment agreement, maybe a proprietary inventions agreement. They have a lot of different names, but they basically say that whatever you work on while you're at that company belongs to that company. You might have um, a non-solicitation agreement in there, which says that uh, you can't solicit employees or customers or relationships away from your current employer. So most of us just sign those things blindly when we take a job, and we might not have even read them. So it's important now to get your hands on them and make sure you actually understand what they say. And if there's any limitations in them that would affect what you want to do. <coughs> then you also should make sure when you leave the company that you don't take anything with you. Don't take manuals, don't take computer files, don't take records. Be very, very clean when you exit. Make sure you only take that which belongs to you and that there can never be a question that you took anything from your prior employer and used it to start your new company. Another thing to consider since in a perfect world, we would um, absolutely leave our prior employer before we start anything new. But that's just not the reality that most of us face. You want to start the company, you're starting to think about it nights and weekends, starting to work on it while you still have your paying job that will pay the rent and feed your children. So if you are doing that, if you're starting to do something while you're still at your current employer, once again, you would do the same thing. You'd make sure that you read all your documents and, and that you're not violating any of your obligations to your current employer. And usually, you would be able to work nights and weekends as long as you're not using company resources. So what does that mean? Most people say, well, I haven't taken anything that belongs to the company. Everything I've done, uh, I've used my own resources. But you need to ask yourself, did you get email on your company email account? Have you gotten voicemails on your company voicemail account? Have you been using your company laptop to work on your business plan? You want to be sure you're very careful and very clean and that you don't do that. Set up a Gmail account, a separate, you know, whatever, Yahoo, Hotmail, anything. Use that exclusively. Set up a separate voicemail if you need to or use your cell phone voicemail. Get your own laptop. Keep everything completely separate so that you're not using company resources. And then when you leave the company, you don't want to necessarily sign anything at your exit interview. And what will often happen is the exit interview of your company, they will give you a document to sign where you reiterate your obligations to the employer. Now, whether or not you sign it has to be a very personal choice, but you think about it. 
If you're not getting anything upon your exit, you have no obligation to sign anything. And we have had clients who their employer forgot to have them sign anything when they came to work, and that piece of paper they signed on their last day, going out the door, created obligations that didn't exist before. So we would recommend that you not sign anything on your way out the door, unless you're in a situation where uh, there's a separation that's been negotiated with the company, maybe it's a layoff or a business change where you're actually getting maybe some severance or some accelerated stock or something. In that case, the employer can absolutely insist that you sign something in order to get the benefits. So that's a choice that you would have to make at that time. What are you getting in exchange for what you're signing? But I think what you might be getting the theme here, documents, legal documents are very important. Make sure you're aware what they are. Make sure you don't sign things unless there's a reason to sign them and you know what they say. And then ultimately, be careful not to solicit your friends. Most companies, and I say this as a generalization, once again, you'd have to look at what's applicable to you, but most companies will have a clause in the employment documents you sign or maybe the employee handbook that says you can't solicit their employees to leave. So that means if um, I leave the company first and uh, Vlad and I have come up with an idea, we've been talking about it, but I leave first and I get the company going and then she leaves to join me, I could be seen as having solicited her to leave. And so I could have a liability to my former employer. So you want to be very careful about what your plans are in that regard, who you've talked to at the company, and how you handle if someone else is going to leave and join you. So are there any questions about that? In general, uh, how does one solve that problem? Soliciting their friends? Well, I mean, <laughs> Well, it's something you have to approach very carefully, and depending on how many people and um, what the timeline is and what your current employer is like, you might want to consult a lawyer before you do it. Um, there is a, a saying that everybody should just quit at the same time, because then nobody could have solicited anybody else. That's probably the most straightforward, not always that realistic. Um, other times people say, well, you know, you get one shot. <laughs> If you solicit a bunch of people, you'll usually get a nasty letter from the employer, but they usually won't sue you over one attempt. Depends on how many people, depends on how senior they are, depends on what your obligations are. Certain companies are more litigious than others. Certain are just known. You take our people, we'll sue you, period. Others are much more flexible. They know that people move around and start companies. So you just kind of have to analyze the individual circumstance. Um, but it is, it's a very common problem, and it happens a lot. You should still wait until you leave to, to actually create any legal entity, or it doesn't matter in that case? <coughs> okay, um, let's talk about that in just a minute. That's a very good question that leads into what we're doing. Do you need me to repeat the questions for the tape, or did you guys pick those up? I got it. We you got don't it. Okay. Um, if your new company is in a similar field, under what circumstances might there be intellectual property issues with the old employer maybe claiming that they own or you know, there's no freedom of property? And that's one of the things, so that's where it's the riskiest. If, if I work at uh, a wireless company and I'm starting a new internet company, the chance that what I'm doing nights and weekends is, is overlapping or a problem with my current employer's IP is much smaller than if I'm starting a new wireless company. Um, you need to be careful. You need to understand what your obligations are. Uh, you cannot use company resources. You cannot use company time. And... Um, you are under California law. Your employer does not own your nights and weekends. Um, if you have a meeting on your new company, you should absolutely take, take your PTO, take your day off. Don't just leave for a few hours. Your employer might not mind if you leave for a few hours and do a personal thing, but you want to be very clear that it was not on your employer's time. And ultimately, it doesn't matter so much when you did it as to whether the IP you used to start it belong to your employer. So you could actually quit and start a new company the next day, and it doesn't mean you're okay if it's, if it's something that belonged to your employer. But certainly where there's an overlap with what you're doing now, uh, you have to be even more careful. Um, so if you, uh, you've been careful about this, but you know, upon exiting or about talking about exiting, there's an idea of a longer transition, and there's you know, a chance, you know, in that case, you start to get that overlap after you've already 
state your intention. Is there any risk because you, you know, now are sort of crossing over that um, you're going to lose control of some of that work? Well, but there's always a. You know what I mean? It's like, well, you know, stay two months instead of two weeks, and you can have, you know, some time here to work on it, which is pretty common, yeah. I imagine. There's always a risk when there's an overlap, and the bigger the overlap, the bigger the risk. Uh -huh. So if you're staying to transition to, to be helpful to your former employer, mm -hmm. you want to make sure you don't fall into the category of what we call no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> you know, you're staying to help them, but it's, it's causing potential harm for your new enterprise. So the best way to do it is to be very upfront with the employer, happy to help you, happy to transition, here's what I'm going to do, please sign this and tell me that you know I'm doing this and you have no problems with it. That's the absolute best. Um, if you can't do that, if your employer won't sign it, then you need to seriously ask yourself if it makes sense to stay and do the transition. And if you decide to do the transition but they won't sign it, then you need to continue to be extremely careful. So, all right, we've left our current employer and now um, what are we going to do? We want to form a company. So, I'm going to cover um, I want to cover when to form a company, what type of entity, and talk a little bit about the location for formation. So uh, first, when to form a company. Um, and I want to see if I can get this to work. Okay. Um, in a perfect world, the minute you start a new venture, you form the company. So I've got an idea right now today. I think I'm going to move forward on it, so I'm going to form the company today. And then I'm going to make sure everything's set perfectly from day one but that's not very realistic. So you have to say, I have to bounce, why wouldn't I want to form it today? I don't want to spend the time, I don't want to spend the money, I don't have to talk to those darn lawyers. So those are the negatives. Um, the benefits are getting everything started right from day one. So you, you have to go along the way and figure out when the benefits and the detriments balance out to start something new. And I realize that's sort of a fuzzy answer. but. Um, some of the things to look at would be when there's more than one person involved. If it's just you, you can go a long time doing stuff yourself and you don't have to worry that there are any issues because you're not going to steal IP from yourself. You're not going to go compete with yourself. It makes it very easy. The minute there's more than one person involved, that's when things start to get complicated. Who owns this IP we're creating? What is the ownership supposed to look like? What are our obligations to one another? So the minute you have more than one person involved is the time to start thinking about whether or not you want to form a company. Also, if you want to start entering into contracts, you could enter into a contract in your personal name, but preferably you want the contracts, you want the intellectual property, you want it all to belong to the corporation. So if you're going to start going out there, or corporation or other entity, if you're going to start going out there and entering into contracts, if you're going to start hiring employees, if you're going to hire contractors, uh, to work on code for you. It's really a time to start thinking about forming a company. So when you want to form a company, you want to ask yourself what kind of company is it going to be? The different types of entities. There's a sole proprietorship, a partnership, limited liability company, which is often called an LLC, and then there's a corporation, which comes in two flavors. One is an S corporation and one is a C corporation. So a sole proprietorship really isn't a legal entity. It's actually the most common form of corporation or company in the world, uh, but it's largely mom and pop organizations and people who are running small businesses that call themselves sole proprietorships. Really the only thing it gets them is um, they're going to operate under another name. So a sole proprietorship, the only thing you have to file legally is uh, a DBA statement. DBA stands for doing business as. <coughs> so it kind of, you know, I create a sole proprietorship, Allison's Law Firm, and I file a DBA that says that. But I still am completely personally liable. There is no legal entity. Uh, all the contracts, although they say Allison's Law Firm, it's really with me personally. So in general, the type of startups that happen in the Valley um, are not formed as a sole proprietorship. So the other type of entity is a partnership. And there are two types of partnership. There's a general partnership and a limited partnership. And a general partnership does not require a lot of documentation to set it up. Uh, it's another reason to think about an entity right from the start. Because if two of us are working together on an idea, we arguably already have formed a general partnership. 
But if we haven't gone to any trouble to document what the terms of that partnership are, we could have issues down the road. The problems with a general partnership is that it has unlimited liability. The general partners are generally liable for all of the debts of the general partnership. The benefits of a general partnership is that it has what's called pass-through tax treatment. So rather than trapping the profits and losses in the entity, they all flow through to the um, taxes of the partners. So if we're starting an entity and there's going to be a lot of losses, rather than just trap them in an entity that can't use them, I as one of the partners, I might have a lot of gains on my taxes that I would love to offset with these losses. So a lot of people will do partnerships to get that pass through tax treatment. And one of the benefits of um, partnerships is they're very flexible. We, I could get all of the losses, but when the gains come, we could do something different with them. Or I could get all of the losses for the first 30 days, and then somebody else could get them for the next 30 days. I mean, whatever you can think of, you can do. Um, the different flavor of a partnership is a limited partnership. That is where the limited partners have limited liability, and the general partner has all the general liability. It still has passed through tax treatment. <coughs> it's harder to form in that you have to make more filings with the state, and you need to have a partnership agreement. And that's the form that most venture funds take. So most venture funds, the investors are limited partners with limited liabilities, and um, then there is a general partner entity. A downside of the limited partnership is that in order to protect themselves and retain that limited liability, the limited partners cannot take, uh, participate in the management of the limited partnership. So if you're starting an entity where there's a couple of you and you're going to all be working together to build it and grow it, you really couldn't have a limited partnership because you're all going to be taking place in the management and operation of the partnership. So the next choice would be a limited liability company. And this is a creature that was created, I don't even know how long ago now, maybe 15, 20 years ago. And it really was meant to be the best of all worlds. It has the limited liability of a corporation, but it has the pass-through tax treatment of a partnership. And this is a popular entity <coughs> when there are going to be many, um, they call them members in an LLC rather than stockholders or partners. There's going to be many members. If you want flexibility, uh, limited, uh, limited liability companies very much like partnerships can be very creative and have unique structures and you can move things around. And um, you also have to, you could make them look as much like a partnership or as much like a corporation as you want. But you do have to file a statement with the state, and you do have to have an operating agreement. So there is a little, it's, it's not that much legal paperwork to form it with the state, but to have a, a valid operating agreement that would really set out everything you wanted to agree to, you would need to spend some time on that. So I'm moving through these quickly, because really the most common form of entity, yeah, go ahead. If you buy an LLC, are you, Well, whether or not you buy an LLC or a corporation or a partnership, it depends on how you bought it. If you buy the entity itself, then you're, you bought it hook, line, and sinker. You bought the assets, you bought the liabilities. If you buy, um, if you buy the assets out of an LLC, then you can pick and choose what assets you want to take and what liabilities you want to assume. Um, and whether or not you're obligated by the contracts depends on what the contract says. But if you were to buy an LLC that had a bunch of contracts and then you breached them, the LLC would be liable for the breach of the contracts, but you'd be the owner of the LLC. So you, in essence, would suffer the results. Right, but if you bought an asset purchase, wouldn't you? <coughs> if you bought, I'm sorry. If you did an asset purchase, then mm. you wouldn't. Right, so if you bought the asset, if you did an asset purchase and you didn't assume certain contracts, then they remain with the LLC you bought things out of, and it would be that LSA's obligation to fulfill them or breach them and suffer the consequences. But that wouldn't really be different um, whether you bought from an LLC or a partnership or a corporation. Those concepts would remain the same. So an S corporation. So corporation is by far the most common form of entity to uh, create a new company. 
And the, there are two different kinds. There's an S corporation and a C corporation. So an S corporation as a C corporation, both corporations have limited liability. The benefit of an S corporation over a C corporation is that it once again has the pass-through tax treatment. But in this case, you don't have the flexibility that you have in an LLC or a partnership. The taxes will pass through the way the stock is structured. And uh, you can't be as creative in drafting it and have it change as often as you want. And you can't have the losses be different than the gains. Uh, to be an S corporation, you must elect before the 15th day of the third month of the taxable year in which the S corporation is formed. Um, and the downsides of the S corporation is that they have a lot of restrictions. You can only have one class of stock. You can't have common and preferred. You can have no more than 100 stockholders. And the stockholders have to be individuals. They have to be US citizens, resident aliens, or eligible trusts or states, which tend to be trusts or states that our trustees are <laughs> US citizens or resident aliens. So for a lot of companies, they might, they might want to have an entity as a stockholder. They might want to have common and preferred stock. They might have foreign nationals who are part of the founding team who they want to get stock. So those are some of the problems with forming an S corporation. But um, there are a lot of benefits depending on what your plans are. <coughs> then the next type, which is sort of the most common, is the C corporation. It has limited liability. Um, you can have multiple stockholders, classes of stocks. There's no limit on how many stockholders you can have. They can be individuals. They can be entities. They can be foreigners. There doesn't have to be a single US citizen as a stockholder. But the downside of a C Corp is that there is a potential for double taxation. And so what does that mean? That means if the C Corp makes a bunch of money, you sell a bunch of products, you make a bunch of money. Now, the, the corporation is taxed on its sales to people. So the money comes into the C Corporation, it's taxed once. Then when the C Corporation wants to get the money out to its stockholders, it could be taxed again. If it pays you a salary, well, you're taxed just like you are a salary. Um, if it pays you as dividends, you're taxed at the dividend rate. So there is an issue that the proceeds and profits can be trapped in the C Corporation and you can't get them out with paying an additional level of tax. So you might say, well, then why does anybody ever form a C Corporation? And the way it works for most startups, you don't really have a lot of profits that you're distributing on an ongoing basis. There's a one-time exit event and that's how the stockholders are going to make their money. So if you form a company, you build it up, and then you sell that company to eBay, eBay is going to most likely buy the stock from the stockholders. And then if the stockholders have held their stock for a year and a day, they're going to get capital gains treatment, and you're not going to have the double taxation. But it is something to be careful of, because if you do an asset sale like we were talking about, if you're not careful, the proceeds for the assets go to the corporation. And so once again, for the corporation to distribute those proceeds out, you could have double taxation. <coughs> you will find, though, that most startups are formed as C corporations, largely because that's the format the VCs are most comfortable with. They're used to coming in to a C corporation. The founders have common stock. The employees have a common stock option pool. The VCs get preferred stock. And there's also a lot of benefits to, um, if you're going to hire employees and issue stock options, only C corporations can issue incentive stock options. And it's much, much more complex to try and share the wealth with an employee in an LLC or a partnership. So because of the ease of the creation of stock options and the ability to do the incentive stock options, that's another reason that a lot of people choose C corporations. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions on corporations? So ease can be manipulated to scale phase. sense to start off with something besides a C or like you want to do an LLC, it gets bigger, you know, you bring in some people, you can change. You can, you know, absolutely. You can change from one form of entity to another. Um, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. Um, it's very hard to go from being a C corporation to being an S corporation, but it's very easy to go the other direction. So lots of times people who think they ultimately want a C corporation where they're going to bring in investors and have different classes of stock. But in the beginning, it's just a couple of people who would like the pass through tax benefits. 
Um, you can form a S corporation, and then when you're ready to bring in outside investors, then you can turn it into a C corporation. You can convert an LLC into a corporation by doing a merger, um, but it can be complex and you can have tax issues. So it's good to try and think about it at the beginning and start off where you want to be or do the sort of S corp into C corp. But that is an important point. If you start off one way and that ultimately isn't the right choice for you, it's not the end of the world. There's probably something you can do to change it. Is there any um, particular advantage of starting, if, if you know you want to end up at a C Corp, but you, for those reasons, want to start somewhere else, LLC versus S Corp, is there one or versus the other that's a better, more advantageous way of migrating? It's much easier start? to go from an L S Corp to a C Corp than from an LLC to a C Corp. Yeah. So if you know that that's ultimately where you want to be, mm -hmm. I'd recommend starting with the S Corp, as long as you could fit within the restrictions of who can be the stockholder. So um, another thing to, to keep in mind <coughs> is a concept called piercing the corporate veil. So we've, we've gone to all this trouble to pick an entity and set up our entity. Um, we've probably picked an entity that has limited liability. We want to make sure that we actually retain that limited liability. And um, the concept of piercing the corporate veil, um, you should think about it as the corporate veil, the, the fact that there's a corporation or a legal entity protects you but creditors or people who want to get beyond that are going to try and pierce it. So how do they do that? If you've formed an entity that's undercapitalized, that allows people to perhaps go after you personally. And what does that mean? That's a big question. How much capital is enough? A lot of it, it, it completely depends on what you're going to do. Uh, some businesses require a lot more capital than others. But if you're going out, entering into contracts that you have absolutely no ability to fulfill, there could be a good argument that you have an undercapitalized entity. Also, you have to be careful <coughs> that the assets are not used for personal reasons, that you really respect the corporate form, that the assets belong to the corporation, that you buy things in the corporate name, that you enter into contracts in the corporate name, and that whenever you sign things, you always say, I don't sign things Allison Leopold Tilly, I sign them Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman by Allison Leopold Tilly. So it's clear that the, in my case, our firm is the one who entered into it, not me personally, and that I am signing in my capacity as a partner of the firm. So you want to make sure when you're signing those contracts, you're always putting the corporate name and then by yourself and you sign in. And then finally, you want to um, follow corporate formalities. You want to have a board of directors and they should meet and they should take actions, and they should do minutes or written consents. Your shareholders, if you need approval of the shareholders to do something, you should actually have a shareholder action that the shareholders sign to approve the item. So once again, that's just it. respecting the corporate form, entering into contracts in the corporate form. So ultimately, how do you decide between all of these choices, an S Corp, a C Corp, an LLC, a partnership? You want to ask yourself some basic questions. Who will be the owners? So we talked about that. Are they individuals or entities? Where are they resident? Um, what type of financing are you going to get? Are you going to bootstrap it? Are you guys going to put the money in? Are you going to get debt, angel investors, VC investors? How will you compensate your employees? Is it going to be salary and bonuses mainly? Or are you going to want to do a lot with equity or stock options? And then to the extent you know, what is the likely exit? Do you want to take it public, partnerships, Theoretically can, but partnerships generally don't go public. LLCs generally don't go public. C corporations go public. Um, if you want to sell it, LLC, you know, any of the entities can be sold. But uh, if you likely have a corporate buyer, they might be more comfortable buying another corporation. You need to think through what the exit is and also for the tax impacts of the exit, how the structure will best suit you. Going back to the win um, slide, you said if more than two people are working on something, you should form a corporation. So if you're you know, studying the feasibility of a business you know, and you're doing all this research and there's a team of four, and you haven't decided yet if you're going to start this business, does that, your claim there, kind of uh, apply to Would that? You? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's the perfect world and there's the reality. In a perfect world, if there's four of you working together on something, you would go ahead and form a legal entity to decide how you're going to divide up the interests. So as you're researching this, you're actually creating intellectual property and you're getting it in the right place. 
The reality, while the four of you are looking into this, you really don't even know if you're going to do this. Are you going to form a legal entity? Probably not. Uh, but if you don't, you want to take some steps, which I'll talk about in a moment, to at least outline what the deal would be. So my answer was really sort of in a perfect world, the minute there's more than one person, you start thinking about whether or not you need a legal entity. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. If, if you decide that you're safe, Yes, definitely. The more you can keep things segregated so you know what things are ultimately going to be in the company, what are going to be the assets and the IP, and what are the obligations that you maybe personally want to be uh, repaid for, the more separate you can keep it, just the easier it is to track all of it and the better records that you have. Certainly, um, when you ultimately form the entity, you want to be very careful that you think to put in everything. For instance, we had a company where as you can imagine, four entrepreneurs started a company, they did a bunch of work. What, what's one of the first things you do? You might think of a name. And you go and you find out if the URL is available, and you reserve it or register for it. Well, if you don't have a company, you can only do it in an individual name. Then a while later, they formed the company. They didn't really think about it. They issued their stock. Ultimately, one of the founders was asked to leave. They raised money. They had a great offer on the table to buy them. And they were a company where branding and name was important. Well, the URL was still in the name of the founder, and guess what? That was the founder they fired. So they had a, you know, he wasn't really going to give it up very willingly. So that's something that you can easily see getting forgotten. You know, you registered for that URL a year ago, and you don't even really think about it. You're just using it. So the more you can keep your records very clean and clear and, and make it easier to transfer it in, the better. A little bit of a related question. If, if before you formed a corporation, you were just kind of working together on something with no actual formalized agreement or anything like this, and then you, uh, you, know, you have some kind of common understanding and then you create a corporation. Does the corporation actually inherit those discussions? Are there actually the people who are kind of taking the risk because there's no, uh, you know, the obligation, there's, there's no real obligation in that case? Well, the, the corporation doesn't just automatically inherit things that aren't contributed into it. So if you've had conversations and you've done a lot of research and you've drafted a business plan, you want to take steps to make sure all of that now belongs to the corporation and that all those involved have assigned their rights to it. And you have to spend some time thinking about, obviously, every single piece of paper you've created is not necessarily that important to the corporation. But usually it's best to deal with it in a more global range. All IP related to this project now belongs to the corporation. So if you are in some people working on feasibility, and part of feasibility is to do contracts, what are some things we can do? So we have a form of a corporation. <coughs> we're basically signing our names. Okay. <laughs> so what, what can we do to kind of mitigate the risk for? Well, right now, if there is no legal entity, the only party that could enter into the contract would be the two individuals. So you could if you wanted to make sure you both had ownership rights in that contract, you could both be signatories to that contract with the third party. You would want to make sure that the contract said it was assignable at your choice, because contracts often have provisions in them that say whether or not you can assign them. So if I enter into this great contract with you, and now you form a company and you want to assign the contract into the company, and I feel like I didn't charge you enough, I might use that as a leverage point to not give my consent for you to be able to transfer it into the company. And you would argue, but wait a minute. The company is the same two people you entered into the contract with, but it is a different legal entity. So you can protect yourself that way by making sure that the contract allows you to do what you want to do in the future. Now, you can't protect yourself personally from liability. To the extent you enter into a contract and you agree to pay me a bunch of money, it's between me and you, and I can come after you personally if there wasn't a legal entity in between us. I was just curious about the point that Piercing the carpet veil. Right. And, and um, how much someone would open themselves up to. As far as, so let's say even on the basic stuff, you know, let's say kind of ground up, just all the drudgery, you know, you're, you're filing paperwork with the state or with the, the government, you know, trademark things, patent things if they're there. Um, those things should be 
only in the name of the corporation or the entity that you're going to do and not in your own name yes. as well, right? Right. And is there is there a definite disadvantage to doing it in your own name initially um, as far as transferring it to the corporation later or changing you know, the thing? Is, like, do, do, you, do you set yourself up improperly to do it that way? Well, the more things that you have to ultimately transfer into the corporation, the harder that it gets. Uh -huh. And different things are easier to transfer. Trademark's actually fairly easy to transfer. But you do have to make, if you've registered that trademark with the PTO, uh, you have to make a filing with the PTO to transfer it into the entity. So how difficult, it depends on what it is. It depends on how many things there are. We're going to get a little bit later. There could be some tax impacts the longer you wait to transfer things in. And for piercing the corporate veil, in general, courts respect legal entities. And they're very hesitant to pierce the corporate veil because, in general, they want corporations to exist. They want them to have limited liability. They want them to be respected. But to the extent you have a bunch of assets, and some are inside the corporation, and some are outside the corporation, that could be used as a factor against you that you know, they didn't really respect this corporate form. They, look, they've got stuff all over the place. The corporation doesn't even own the main asset. I mean, if, the corp if you own that patent and that patent is the most valuable asset, they don't even have to pierce the corporate veil. They can go after you personally because you have the asset they're trying to get. So uh, it, it could add to your problems if you don't do a good job of getting everything in. I have two questions related to that. The first is on the, um, in the case of the patent, for example, can you, um, write contracts between you as an individual and, you, and your corporation, or is that really seen as a piercing? Like, for example, if you have a patent, <coughs> you care of selling it in yet, you can you know, give 100-year uh, rights to use it or whatever. Or is that seen as a sort of a, you know, a legal mechanism to avoid? Um, it depends. And, you know, so many of these are very facts and circumstance specific. Mm -hmm. If th there are certainly people who have patents and then they start companies and they license the patents into the companies but they retain the patent themselves and that's not per se going to allow someone to pierce the corporate veil. Especially if there are several people involved in the corporation and they're taking this license to the patent and they're going off and doing X with it and you're retaining the patent because you're doing or you're planning to do Y with it. But if you set up this corporation and it's just you and the corporation enters into a bunch of contracts, but you keep the main asset outside, there could be an argument that it's undercapitalized. You'd have to look at the circumstance and try and figure out why it was being done and, and how much you respect the formalities. And the, my follow-on is, this is much more tactical, in the, in the early phases where, you know, you're doing a lot of work on, uh, you know, your own computer, you know, do you need to sell assets like that in? Or can you just, you know, is that even worth bothering with, things like that? Well. Usually we try and deal with it with a much more general statement. All IP in connection with the formation of the company belongs to the company. Uh -huh. um, we ask the founders to think if there's specifically, if there's a patent, if there is a URL, if there is a contract, to be very specific about those and you can be more general about the other things. Okay. Thank you. But if, if two of you have spent a couple of months working on an idea and there is no company, you both own it. So you could both now go off and try and capitalize on it. Okay, so we're going to keep moving on here. The last question is where do I incorporate? If I've decided to form a corporation, I need to incorporate it somewhere. Now there's 50 states in this country, but I've just picked two to talk about. California since we're here, and Delaware since it's the most common place for corporations to be formed. So you have to decide, once again, you're weighing the pros and the cons. In a perfect world, I would have everybody incorporate in California because it's our state and it'd be nice to support it. Um, but Delaware actually has made its business out of making life easy for corporations. They make it easy to form a corporation, to file things, to work with them. They have a very well-defined corporate code and case law. It's very favorable to corporations. It's favorable to officers and directors. So the reality is that ultimately most corporations and the majority of public companies are all incorporated in Delaware. California, if, if you do incorporate in Delaware, though, and you're doing business in California, you will still have to qualify to do business in California, and that can lead to some double payments over time. And ultimately, when you're big and successful, you will pay more taxes in Delaware than you would in California. 
<coughs> so some of the benefits to California is if you're operating here and you form your company here, then you're not having to double pay and pay Delaware as well. Some of the downsides to being in California is that it's much harder to work with the California Secretary of State when you want to make changes to your articles and make corporate filings. I've got some heads nodding here. Anyone who's dealt with California knows that. Um, there are different voting standards on mergers in California than there are in Delaware. We could talk for probably half an hour about the differences between California and Delaware, so I won't bore you with that. But I'll just throw it out there that it's something to think about carefully. Once again, it's not something that can't be changed. If you're a California company, you can reincorporate into a Delaware company. If you're a Delaware company, you could reincorporate into a California company. It's just if you spend some time in the beginning thinking about what you want, you can save yourself time and money later. Does, does there need to be some proxy in Delaware or something? I mean, how does that actually work? If you form a Delaware company, you need a registered agent in Delaware, but there's lots of companies who are willing to do that for you. They charge about $125 a year, so it's fairly reasonable. They will act as your agent for service of process, and um, they will do that. I really, um, I, I really wish California would get a little more friendly to corporations. But unfortunately now Delaware has such a big head start with their extensive body of case law and it just keeps growing stronger and stronger that they really, uh, they have focused on that as a revenue source for the state. I have one question on the, the, the California aspect of it because I looked a little at it and it started to confuse me the more I did in the sense that as far as the cost, you know, I think like, oh, it's ultimately cheaper in the beginning to file in, in Delaware. Delaware seem like to me, and then it <coughs> got more, comp more expensive if you wanted to do business in California at that time, because let's say, let's say um, you start off, it seemed like there were fees just to establish, I forgot the term that they used, but just, just to sell stuff in California, and also kind of the fee that they would charge you to, to uh, well, the fee that they would do to do that, you know, like to conduct business, how much it would cost you. Well, it costs about $800 a year in California. That's a franchise tax that's due every year. Right. It's um, your first year, it's included in your filing fee. So don't form your company in December because no. then you're going to owe it again come January. Um, there are certainly filing fees when you file things with the Secretary of State. There's fees involved, but they're not huge. You can, if you want things quickly, you can end up paying several hundred dollars to get things on an expedited basis. But um, in general, the main fee is the franchise tax that's every year. In Delaware, so if you're, if you're incorporated in California or if you're qualified to do business in California, you're going to pay that same $800 every year. Delaware, um, you pay your taxes based on your assets and your outstanding shares. There's a complicated calculation. In the early years, it, can be, it could be 50 bucks. But ultimately, when you're a big, successful public company, you're going to pay way more in taxes in Delaware than you would in California. I'm not familiar with what you're referring to. I mean, if, you register, if, if, you, if you're not incorporated in California and you're doing business here, you're supposed to qualify as a foreign corporation and register to do business in California. But to do that is the $800 fee. I don't know the other fees that you read about. <laughs> so I don't want to go too far down that path because I'm not a tax lawyer okay. and your ability to use losses to offset gains, it depends on the type of losses and the type of gains and very much on your personal tax situation. But the cost of a company, the $800 to set it up, anything you pay employees, you know, the cost of registering your URL, those are all costs of the company that ultimately can lead to losses and might be able to be offset against things, but you really want, want to check with an accountant because you can't just, it's not as clear as taking all losses and just setting it off against your income. Yeah, um, what are you talking about an international company that is 
go ahead and be doing business in many different countries, not necessarily in the US. Does it make sense to incorporate here or? That's a very good question. And more and more uh, startups are getting formed and they're incorporating offshore. So you have to look at it. Once again, it's one of those questions of trying to start things right from the beginning. There's a lot of companies that are formed in what are known as tax havens, the Cayman Islands or the British Virgin Islands. And that will often happen if maybe most of your investors are going to be offshore or most of your business is going to be offshore. You can start off uh, forming offshore right from the start. There's a multitude of reasons for doing that. It can lower your overall tax rate. If you have foreign investors, many of them don't want to have anything to do with the U.S. and so they're very reticent to invest in a U.S. company. So you have to think about what the plans are for the company. What we see often is someone incorporating in the Cayman Islands and then they incorporate a Delaware subsidiary and that's who the U.S. employees work for. And then there's often a contract back and forth between the Delaware company and the Cayman company. You want to think about what your reasons are for incorporating offshore. If you're trying to keep your IP offshore, you want to make sure you do that very carefully and enter into the right contracts. <coughs> if you're trying to lower your overall effective tax rate because most of your sales are going to be offshore, you want to be careful how you do that. And then ultimately sometimes people will do it for flexibility. A Cayman company can go public on the US stock exchange, it can go public on the Hong Kong stock exchange, a BVI company cannot go public on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So it, thinking it through at the beginning, but it's a good point because more and more companies are starting with entrepreneurs in the US, but with a much more global reach. And so starting a, with a US company right from the start might not be the right choice. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. We've formed our company in um, California or Delaware, we've decided, let's say we've decided to form a C corporation. That's really what I'm going to talk about going forward since that's the most co common form for the startup companies. So you need to think about what you need to do. You need to have officers and directors and you might want to have an advisory board. <coughs> so the required officers, you must have a president, a treasurer, and a secretary. That's true for both California and Delaware. I can't speak to all 50 states, but it's pretty common. Those tend to be the three roles that you need to fill. It can be the same person. So I could have all three titles, or we could have three different people, or I could be the president and the secretary, and someone else could be the treasurer. It's just that you need all three offices filled. And then we can have as many different titles as we want. I could be the chief Yahoo, as they have at Yahoo. But those are the three required officers that you have to have. And then you want to ask yourself, how many directors do I need? In Delaware, you need at least one director. In California, you need one director if you have only one stockholder, two directors if you have two stockholders, three directors if you have three stockholders, and that's where it stops. So if you have four to a thousand or however many in California, you still only need three directors. So that is the <coughs> required number, but you also want to ask yourself, what is the optimal number? Usually, people try and have a board of directors that is an odd number so that there can't be a deadlock. I have to admit, I haven't seen a deadlock in a board very often. So sometimes I think people get a little too wrapped up in making it an even number. But it is generally a rule of thumb, if at all possible, keep it to an even number. And then who, who should my directors be? Usually the founders, one or two or more of them are on the board. Sometimes the investors are on the board. Sometimes you get outside industry people who can be valuable to you to be on the board. So you want to think about how many directors you want. I would strongly advise against too many. A brand new startup does not need seven directors. Five is even probably too many. Three is probably about right. When you bring on your investors, they're going to have certain requirements. So if you do a Series A round, the Series A are probably going to require a seat. They might require one seat. They might require two. The founders are going to want to protect themselves and keep a couple seats, one or two. Uh, there might be a seat for the CEO, whoever that might be. And then there might be seats for outside directors. I've got my fun little picture here for you of um, sort of a typical board structure after a series of financing. The founder has a seat, the series A director has a seat, the series B director has a seat, the CEO has a seat, which may or may not be another founder, and then there's an outside director. <coughs> so that would be a very common formulation you can see even as far as after the Series B round, there's still just five directors. And then for advisory boards, that is a way 
And it's a good way to bring people in rather than just fill up the board with a whole bunch of people. If there's people you want to have involved in the organization who are going to give you advice and guidance and help, um, you can put them on an advisory board. You usually compensate them with some equity and then they can help you with different needs. People sometimes have quarterly advisory board meetings, sometimes annual advisory board meetings. I think the thing to be careful of there is not to have too many people on your advisory board and to be very clear with them what your expectations are because a lot of people have given away a lot of stock to advisors who ultimately haven't really helped them. And so you probably want to put vesting on them too so that you can make sure that they, they have to perform. <coughs> so now, founder stock purchase agreement. We have created the company, we've got our officers and directors, we need to split up the stock. So this is, um, I want to talk about the allocation of stock among founders, how you can pay for your stock, and talk about vesting. Excuse me, who decides uh, how many? How uh, many? The directors, <coughs> the founders. So who decides to, to remove one director, for example? That's a good question. So in the beginning, well, first of all, by law, you might have a requirement. If you have more than three uh, stockholders, three or more in California, you'd have to have at least three seats. But it's negotiated in the beginning by the founders. The people who start the company in the beginning will decide how many directors and who they're going to be. And then as additional investors come in, that will probably change. They'll contractually have agreements for seats. And it's very important to understand not only who is currently sitting in the seat, but who has the right to that seat. So <coughs> if you and I are founders and we say, okay, the two of us will be on the board, and I think, okay, good, I've got my seat, um, but you have more stock than me, you could probably ultimately kick me off the board. So you, you need to understand going into it who has a right to fill those seats. That can be a very complicated analysis. In California, there's something called cumulative voting, which means if there's three seats, that are up for election, I get three times my amount of stock so I can put all of my shares to vote for one person to make sure that I can at least fill one seat versus in Delaware there isn't cumulative voting and it's one share, one vote. But it's um, certainly something that's really important to understand is who can fill those seats, who can remove directors. Directors are much easier to put in place than they are to remove and how that would all work. So when you split up the stock, one of the things to remember, this is absolutely my pet peeve that anyone who's talked to me before will know. Start early from the very first day. And this is something that even if you don't form that corporation, write it down on a napkin, but agree right from the start who's going to have how much stock and what its general terms are. I have seen <coughs> many cases where entrepreneurs have gotten very far down the road and then they find out that they don't agree on the stock. Probably the worst case I had was four founders came in to me. Uh, they hadn't worked with me before. They'd been working for about a year on an idea, and they finally had a term sheet. Most of them had quit their jobs, and they had been working on the project ranging from six months to a year. So I said, great. Let, they had actually formed a corporation, but they hadn't, they'd done it online. They hadn't issued any stock. So I said, okay, great. We need to get all the corporate formalities set up. I need to get the stock issued to you guys. You're going to need to tell me what the breakdown is, who's going to be in what role, and what vesting there is. And they said, not a problem, not a problem. We've talked about this before. Let's talk about the term sheet. So we talked about the term sheet. And when they left, they said, we'll email you the exact breakdown of stock so you can get it all done. So the next day, I get this email. Well, we're having a little problems talking about the stock. Well, we'll get back to you. Two weeks later, they disbanded. They couldn't agree. They had spent all this time, they'd quit their jobs, they'd finally had their term sheet, and the four of them could not agree. They thought that they had an understanding, and they didn't. So I can't reiterate enough how important it is, right from the start, if there's more than one person, that you guys are on the same page as to who owns the stock, who owns how much, and what the rights are. Because otherwise, you have both of you, or three of you, or four of you, arguably having rights to the technology and the ideas, and you don't have a legal entity, and you don't have any binding contracts, and you could have a real mess on your hands. So right from the start, you should agree on what the percentage ownerships are. <coughs> and you should remember that there are only 100 percentage points. I have people come in and say, you know, 50 to me, 50 to you, and 20 to the option pool. Okay, that doesn't really work. I've also had people come in, and they've got their whole cap table all the way through the IPO worked out. That also is not important. 
you want to think about the fact that there's only 100 percentage points to divide up among the founders on day one. All future stock will dilute and change that, but right now you're focusing on dividing up the 100 percent of the pie. <coughs> and what you want to think about is, first of all, ownership interests. If there's four of us, is it 25 percent each? Is it 50, 20, 15, 15, if I got that right? Um, what are the percentages? And then you want to talk about what the titles are. Who's going to be the CEO? Who's going to be the COO? Who's going to be the VP of engineering? And then you want to talk about vesting. So is everyone here familiar with vesting? Or OK. So the way, the way stock options tend to work is you get a stock option, and it vests over time, which means I have a right to exercise my option, which grows. Let's say it vests in four one-year cliffs. I can buy 25% of my shares under my option the first year, 50, the second, et cetera. With founders, we usually do something that we call reverse vesting. So you buy all of your stock on day one, and the company has a right to repurchase it, which lapses over time. It's really the same concept. Your right to keep that stock grows over time, just like your right to exercise the option grows over time. But you're actually buying the stock on day one you start your holding periods for tax purposes. You can vote the stock. You control it as long as you keep it. <coughs> so when you're thinking about vesting, you have to really think about it with two hats on. Founders often think about it as we're a group of founders, and we want to keep the VCs from getting our stock. If they come in and invest in our company and fire us, we want to make sure we can keep all of our stock. That's certainly one thing to think about. The other thing to think about, though, is the founders vis-a-vis -vis one another. You're all starting out this company. Let's use my example, four founders, 25% each. Nothing horrible has to happen. You can remain best friends for your entire life. But let's say somebody's parent gets sick somewhere else, and they have to leave the company. They can no longer work day to day and help the company. But if they have 25% of the stock fully vested, so I, I've got the stock, I go and I leave, and the three of you have the exact same stock as me, but you have to toil night and day for years to make this company worthwhile. That's not really fair. So you want to talk about some sort of vesting on the stock that people have to stay around to earn it. It gets very complicated because there can be discussions about how much is vested on day one. You could start out where nobody has anything on day one and it vests monthly over four years. That's pretty straightforward. You could put a one-year cliff in there, like there is for many options and like you'll probably use for your employees in the future, because maybe the four of you haven't really worked together before, and you're worried that you might not ultimately end up working out or staying together. So you might say, well, let's, let's say nobody can actually earn anything of their stock for a year to make sure that this is really going to gel, and then at the end of the year, they get their 25%. You could start out and say, this person brought the patent into the equation. So we're going to give them 20% vested day one and their rest vests over time and the rest of us are going to start at day one. As you can see, you, it can be as complex as you want it to be. It's just really important that you figure it out from day one. Does anybody have any questions on that? Well, everyone's got founder stock investing down? That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, and so you're all going to figure it out right from day one, right? Because you all understand this. Yeah. Um, so how are you going to pay for your stock? Oh, I guess you're not. OK, the legal forms of payment for stock is clear the cash. Cash works, actually. You can write a check. You can pay green cash. You can um, wire money. There can be cancellation of debt. Maybe you've um, paid that $800 to the state out of your own checkbook. So you're going to, that's a debt the company owes you. You can use the cancellation of that debt to pay for your stock. You can use past services to pay for stock. You cannot use future services to pay for stock. So if I've done a wor bunch of work, in getting this all set up, I can use that, but I can't get stock for the promise of future work. And I can also contribute assets. I can contribute computers, hard assets. I can contribute soft assets like IP. I can contribute patents, anything. So it's fairly easy to pay for the stock, but you want to make sure it's done, and you want to make sure it's done right, even if you're only paying a dollar for the stock. If you can't prove that you ultimately paid that dollar, you might have problems proving that you own that stock at the end of the day. We've had that happen. A company gets started, the founders form it off on their own. It's minimal purchase price. They never actually pay it. And then when they go to sell the company, they can't prove that they own the stock because they can't prove they paid for it. 
literally taking your dollar bill and photocopying it on the photo machine and sticking it in the file. That's proof, but you want to have proof. We usually recommend that you write a check because that's a little easier than copying dollar bills. But be sure that you actually take the action and you pay for your stock. You also want to think about the tax impacts. Paying with cash is pretty clear. That becomes your basis. There's not a lot of tax impacts. But the one you really need to think about is when you're contributing assets. If I'm putting assets into a company and I'm getting stock back, I arguably have a taxable event. I've written this patent and now I'm getting $5,000 worth of stock for it. I've just gotten $5,000 worth of value and arguably I have a taxable event where I'm taxed on $5,000. I didn't get $5,000 of cash, so paying the tax is going to be difficult for me. So you want to be careful when you're forming a company, especially if you've done some of this work ahead of time and now you're dumping everything into the company. You can do it with what's called a 351 exchange. <coughs> and I'm going to give you just a quick overview of that. But if you get to the point where you're doing that, make sure you get some specific advice that you're doing it correctly. The concept behind a 351 exchange is that if people are putting in cash and property in exchange for stock, that they can do it in a tax-free way. It's important that those who are paying cash and property are getting 80% or more of the company's value out. It does not work if someone is putting in services. They can be putting in services for that 20%, but, but services don't count. It's, it's, it's cash and property. <coughs> and it can be, it's largely solely in exchange for stock. There is some ability to get a little bit of cash out. But the point being that you need to do it very carefully, otherwise you can have some unintended tax events. Something as simple as just saying, we contribute all the IP in the company and we each get this many shares of stock, seems pretty straightforward, and then suddenly you find out that you owed some taxes you didn't pay. Go ahead. Would you do the same trip to the lawyer at, at corporations? <laughs> you usually do this all, all at once? Yes. Because normally what happens is that you incorporate the company and you issue that stock on day one. So what we would do is we would sit with you and we'd talk about everything, you know, talk about the formation and the form that works for you, talk about the founder stock, talk about what you might have outside the company that you want to get in, and then it would be done all as one event. And that's also important for a 351. It all has to happen at the same time. So. Like I talked about earlier, when you're doing this, make sure that no founder holds IP individually, that you got it all into the company in connection with the issuance of this founder stock. And then don't forget the 83B election. <coughs> what that is, is if you get stock that's, the magic words under the tax code are subject to a substantial risk of forfeiture, you will owe taxes as that stock vests. So I get 1,000 shares of stock and it's worth a thousand bucks, that's what I paid, but it vests. So on year one, 250 shares that I paid $250 for vest. Let's say they're now worth $2 a share. So when my 250 shares vest, I actually owe taxes on $250, the $1 gain in my stock. And then a year from now, another 250 shares vest, and those are now worth $5. So I'm taxed on the $4 gain. And I don't have any money to pay those taxes because I didn't really have an exit event. Just under the tax laws, I had a tax event. So that's a really bad consequence. Obviously, for $250, you could probably manage it, but hopefully you have a lot more stock that's growing with a lot more value. So what you can do is when you get your stock, you have to file something that's called an 83B election. It's due within 30 days of when you got your stock, period. There's no extensions, there's no exceptions. It's a very draconian rule. So it's the one thing you must never forget. We have literally had people who would exercise stock at a company, forget to file their 83B, and then come to the VP of HR and say, I can't afford to work here anymore because the company is doing so well. My stock is growing so quickly. The taxes that I'm owing on a quarterly basis for failing to file my 83B are, are a real problem for me. So it, it can have a very bad impact, and you want to make sure that you, you just don't let that happen, that you don't forget your 83B election. So, and any um, more questions on payment for founder stock? So based on what you said, it sounds like, <coughs> assuming you're you know, going to be working on something that's adding value, um, 
the, uh, any kind of vesting schedule is kind of a disadvantage versus issuing stock right away. Um, you mean because of the 83 B issues? Yeah, it, well, in general, because every time you vest, you have to, yeah, you're. Uh, Not if you file your 83 B. If you uh -huh. file your 83, I guess I didn't tell you the result of filing the 83 B. If you file your 83 B, then you don't have to pay taxes until you ultimately sell the stock, uh -huh. until you have an exit event. So your 83 B will protect you from all those uh, adverse so that, consequences. That, that creates the indifference between vesting now or, uh, or getting it all now or vesting over time. I mean, I mean they're both equivalent from a tax perspective as long as you take care of that. Yeah, as long as you file the 83 B, uh, you don't have that tax issue. And so then you have all the other reasons to have vesting for fairness and, okay. and such, but you don't have the adverse tax consequences. So I think we've talked, um, we've already covered most of this on vesting. You want to talk about the general terms. You want to talk about whether or not there's a cliff. Um, accelerators, <coughs> basically you will um, often provide that the stock accelerates if a certain event happens. If you're fired without cause, if there's a change of control, if there's a change of control and you're fired, that's called the double trigger because two things have happened. And that's all a negotiation between the founders initially and ultimately when the investors come in, they'll probably have something to say about that as well. You don't, you want to be careful if every, everybody says, sometimes people will say, let's have everybody vest when there's a sale of the company. That's really nice and great, but it's going to be a problem. It's going to lower the price for the company because the purchaser is buying two things basically. They're buying IP and they're buying people. And if all the people can walk out the door the day after the merger, they're not going to want to pay as much. So you have to balance things like wouldn't it be nice for us if all our stock vested on a change of control with the fact that that's not a very wise business decision. So maybe you decide there's a little bump in vesting, a little celebration. We all get 20% vesting on a change of control but not 100%. Um, you might want, you as an individual want to make sure that if you get fired without cause, all of your stock vests. You as a company want to protect the company and say, well, probably didn't fire them for no reason and we probably have to hire someone to take their place so we don't necessarily want them walking out the door with all their stock. <coughs> so for the accelerators, you want to make sure that you've sort of thought through the different events that could happen and have made decisions about what you want to do. Also, you usually have rights of first refusal against stock in a private company so that even if you have vested stock, if you want to sell it to somebody else, the company might have a right to buy it instead. Usually that would be at the price that you were going to sell it to somebody else. But that's something that's usually put in place. And you can have changes to vesting over time. <coughs> so now I've left uh, five full minutes to can talk about... Um, um, I sure. I'm sorry for taking so much time. Um, can you put in uh, uh, can you put in language about um, uh, restrictions or uh, you know if you have three, four partners in an S corp or a C corp whatever that you can uh, aside from the right to buy it back you can simply restrict their ability to sell so if the partner decides they want out they still want to sell to somebody that you just paid you know you cannot have um, it's not legal to have what's called an absolute restraint on alienation you cannot simply state you may not transfer your stock that's illegal. So that's one of the reasons that rights of first refusal came into play because um, it was a way of restricting it or at least making sure that the stock didn't get out in the world to where you didn't know since you can't just flat out say you can't sell it. So now you've formed your company, you've issued the stock to the founders, what's the next thing you normally do? You often hire employees and you issue them stock. <coughs> so a stock option is a right to purchase stock, which usually vests over time. It's not actually ownership of the stock until you exercise your option. It's usually done under a stock option plan, and it's very much a creature of tax. So you want to make sure that you do it correctly, that you follow all the rules in issuing them. Only the board of directors can issue equity. I'm going to say that again. Only the board of directors can issue equity. So when the CEO hires someone and says, I'm going to give you an option to purchase 50,000 shares, that is not an issuance of a stock option. The board of directors has to approve that. I'll get emails from my clients. I've hired another advisor. I just want to give him 20,000 shares. I don't have to do one of those board consent things again, do I? And unfortunately, yes, you do. Only the board can issue equity. So usually what happens is the board will meet once a month. They'll have a list of stock options, and they'll approve them. You need to be very, very careful in issuing stock options. 
They're very temperamental in how to do them right. Um, you can only issue them to employees. Well, it depends on what your plan says, but it's usually employees, directors, and consultants. So I hire Vlada. She's starting at the end of the month. I have my board meeting today. She's already said yes, so I issue her $50,000. Or fifty thousand dollars, fifty thousand. It's going to be worth fifty thousand dollars, and the board approves it. I'm good, right? Well, no, because she's not an employee today. <laughs> she's accepted the offer, but she's not an employee today. So I merrily go along my way, and then when I go to sell the company, I find out that Blada got stock today on February 26th, and she didn't start until March 1st. What does she have? I thought I gave her an incentive stock option. She doesn't have one. So it's something to be very, very careful of because the rules are very tricky. I say beware of idle promises because a lot of people along the way make promises right and left. Help me with this and I'll give you some shares. Help me with that, I'll give you 1%. What does that mean, 1%, 1% calculated when? Um, so we often find people who show up and they've made so many promises and trying to extricate them from them or even figure out what they're supposed to mean can be extremely difficult. You really want to understand when you make a promise of 50,000 shares, is that 1% of the company? Is it a half a percent of the company? Is it 10% of the company? You shouldn't think of it just in shares and numbers. You should think of it in percentages. And you should also budget it out. That also helps you from giving away too much. If each individual hire, you're giving away options, but you've never really looked at the whole picture of who you need to hire and how many shares it's going to take, you can often find yourself in a position you don't want to be in. <coughs> uh, more and more common these days is something called restricted stock, which is instead of options, that tends to be more at the public company level, but that is where you generally tend to make an outright stock grant. You don't have a price to pay, an exercise price like you do with an option. I'm giving you a set number of shares. They can still vest. Um, usually you get less restricted stock than options since you don't have to pay anything. Um, all options need a price when they're granted. Once again, you need to think of vesting and whether you can have early exercise. Early exercise makes an option more like founder's stock. It says you can exercise it on day one and hold it, and the company has a right to repurchase it over time versus an option that you can't buy until it's vested. An option has no voting rights. You're not a stockholder of the company. So a lot of times people, when they're figuring out who can vote on something or what it's going to take to pass something. They count the employees as voting with the common, but if the employees have options, they can't vote. So you have to keep in mind when you're calculating the votes that you have to take the options out of the mix. <coughs> um, how much is enough? <laughs> That's always a question that you have to ask yourself, but once again, you can deal with that if you think about your budgets and your percentages. And my last point on stock options is there are no secrets. You have to assume that all of your employees are going to find out what everybody else has. It almost always happens. It often causes problems. So you want to make sure that you've thought through that and you understand that if you're giving people different amount of shares, they're going to probably know about it and is that going to cause you problems. And to the extent you want to limit how many people know, you need to treat the options and the paperwork very carefully. So any um, Questions about stock options in general? I know we kind of went through that quickly. <coughs> and lastly, when you hire these people, you want, to, um, you want to have them sign an offer letter. My first question, why can't everyone work for free? Steve Jobs works for a dollar. Isn't that okay? No, it's not okay. Apple's violating the law. The Department of Labor does not care. <laughs> they might care if you do it. So under California law, you must pay minimum wage. To certain uh, level of employees, you must pay double minimum wage. Um, I know you've all got tons of friends who've started companies and they didn't pay anybody. It happens all the time, but you just have to understand that there are risks involved with it because it is technically a violation of California law. <coughs> you do want to have offer letters with your employees. California is an at-will state. But if you're not careful, you might create employment that's not at will. At will means you can fire somebody at any time for any reason. So you want to make sure that when you're bringing on employees, you carefully document it. You give them offer letters. You say that they're at will. You make it clear what their obligations are. You want everyone from day one, including the founders, to sign a proprietary inventions agreement. 
And what that is, is that's the agreement that you've probably signed with your current employers that say that the company has a right to all IP that is created while you're at work and uh, has been on solicit and other things. Um, you, so you were saying that's earlier at the beginning, that's only while at work, not during nights and weekends, is that correct? According to California State Law, they said something about that. Your company cannot own your nights and weekends. There is um, labor codes about that. But you can be careful that that the intellectual property of the company belongs to the company. So if I take the stuff I'm working on during the day for the company and I just work on it at nights and weekends, that's not going to protect me. I'm still taking something from my employer. But um, you're right, there is um, the, the codes out there that say that the company doesn't own 100% of your time. And last but not least, if you're hiring consultants to do work for you, Consultants actually are the exception. They can work for just stock. You don't have to pay the minimum wage if they truly are a consultant. If they work for you 50 hours a week and they don't work for anybody else and they come to your offices every single day and they use your facilities and equipment, they're probably not a consultant. But if they are truly a consultant, you can enter into a consulting agreement with them and make arrangements to pay them in stock. But once again, it's really important to document it so it's clear how much did you promise them? Are there milestones? What do they have to do to earn this stock? So that, that's really kind of the, the overview of leaving your employer and starting your company. And um, the things I want to remind you of is that you should take care when you're leaving your current employer. You should start with the proper infrastructure, you know, forming a company as soon as possible. You should agree on the stock ownership and terms up front. And you should make your board and advisors a part of your team. And you should leverage them. So thanks.